Shalom Chavrim. I'm Stephen Benuni. You're watching Israeli News Live, a prophetic segment of the broadcast this evening. And I, I really want to ask my Jewish brothers and sisters, really pay close attention this evening, uh, especially my Christian uh, friends around the world, brothers and sisters as well. This is an important message tonight. It's something the Lord has revealed to me today. Uh, it is news related. I think it's important for those that are looking at the news to also take a look at this prophetic broadcast tonight. The Pope's magicians have no answers is the title of this. And of course, coming from the story of uh, Joseph, Pharaoh, when he gathers all of his magicians and, and sorcerers and, and wise men and can find no answers to the dreams that he has. And by the way, don't forget, those dreams, according to Joseph, were from God himself. So I see this as a type of the biblical layout today. The dreams and visions of the prophets, and yet the Pope's magicians and wise men and sorcerers and astrologers, like in the days of Daniel, have no answers at all. As your evangelists, prophets, priests, and what have you, they do not know the correct interpretation. Let's take a look at this real quick here in light of what's going on. The Pope's most powerful quotes about climate change. I took this uh, here from, uh, I wanted to bring this out because he kind of, really brought the climate change to, to a tr true global forefront. I know that we can go back and look at uh, uh, different other people over the last couple of decades that have been talking about it. Al Gore, for example, and his documentary about climate change. I did go see that, by the way, years ago at the theater. Uh, it, it was... Uh, <laughs> We won't go into that. <laughs> anyway, one of his statements are, we are at the limits of suicide. Now, this is on the Huffington Post. It was uh, uh, done on 12-1-2015. And by the way, I don't know if that is uh, under uh, American dates, December the 1st, 2015, or if that's under European dates, which would be January the 12th, 2015. Not sure about that, guys. I apologize for that. Anyway, this is the quote that really I thought was interesting. In a few days, an important meeting on climate change will be held in Paris. Must be December, like American. It will be sad, and I dare even say catastrophic, were particular interest to prevail over the common good. And he was speaking about the Climate Change Conference in Paris, France, back in December 2015, last year. All right, now also we know the famous encyclical that the Pope wrote about climate change. And he talks about the planet and speaks as the planet as our mother. And, you know, and, and truly we even, you know, we see that in Genesis. God says that, that the earth brought forth the vegetation the earth brings forth. So there is a, a, a type of, uh, uh, you know, the, the earth being a mother as well because she does bring forth, we see in Genesis. Uh, that's not the issue for me, but it's the whole idea of the encyclical is about climate change. One little point I just want to share with you on this right here. He says, more than 50 years ago with the world teetering on the brink of nuclear crisis, Pope, as he calls it, St. John the 23rd, wrote an encyclical which not only rejected war but offered a proposal for peace. He addressed his message, uh, Pasim Antares, to the entire Catholic world, and indeed, to all women of goodwill. Now, faced as we are with global environmental deterioration, I wish to address every person living on this planet in my apostolic exhortation, Evangelii Guadillum, I can't pronounce these words, I wrote to all the members of the church with the aim of encouraging ongoing missionary renewal in this encyclical. I would like to enter the dialogue with all people about our common home. You see, the problem is they know disaster's coming on the earth, but they don't know what to do about it. All right? It's even prophesied. This is why I, I titled the, the, the message the way I did, because you have to remember the Pharaoh of Egypt during the time of Joseph, when Joseph was taken down captive into Egypt as a prisoner, sold by his own brethren, he goes down there, but Pharaoh, he has these dreams. The dreams are given to him by God, but none of his people could answer the dreams. He, he sought out everybody. The book of Jasher, we'll go into that in a little bit, but the book of Jasher goes into detail. The astrologers, the, not the astrologers, but the soothsayers, the wise men and the magicians, all of them trying to interpret his dreams and none of them could get it. And it's the same thing today. 
Today we have anointed dreams and visions of the prophets that have written the Bible, and we see a catastrophic things written in there about our day, even including in the book of Enoch, and yet none of these wise men of the churches seem to get it. All right? Now, let me share with you, now this is their scientific wise men, you might say. James Hansen, fossil fuel addiction could trigger runaway global warming. Now, I want to give you both sides of the coin. I lean towards it being Planet X. But, even without Planet X, this is a serious problem going on. Now, this no doubt is from the political side to let everybody feel all fuzzy inside that there's not a Planet X coming. But this is what uh, James Hansen says here, and this was on July 10th of 2013. The world is currently on co course to exploit all its remaining fossil fuel resources. Sure they are. They're over there killing each other over it in the Middle East right now. That seems to be the greatest fossil fuels left in the world is the Middle East, and they're killing everybody over it. They're making sure that there's going to be no Arabs living in the land whatsoever, so they have nothing but drilling places. Anyway, a prospect that would produce a different, practical, uninhabitable planet. That's what he says. Because it's remaining fossil fuels, because they're exploiting the remaining fossil fuels resources, a prospect that would produce a different, practically uninhabitable planet by triggering a low-end runaway greenhouse effect. This is the conclusion of a new scientific paper by Professor James Hansen. Now, he says that would happen by 2030. So friends, it ain't even if you didn't look at Planet X as an idea, James Hansen's got it going down pretty quick, pretty fast himself. And that's just a brief look at it. I want to look at you, give a wise man from Russia what he says. Now, this particular scientist here tends to give you some evidence that there is something lurking in the universe. The Russian scientist says planets' uh, atmospheres are changing. This is by Art uh, Rosenblum, who wrote this on awaken.cc. Uh, he says, and the planets are having change in their fields. And he's quoting, by the way, he's quoting here. This is, uh, uh, this is the Russian scientist, and I forget his name right offhand, but I'll, I'll, I'll have it for you in just a moment. Uh, he says here that, that the planets are having a change in their fields. The magnetic fields are becoming stronger. Jupiter's magnetic field has more than doubled. Uranus's magnetic field is changing. Neptune's magnetic field is increasing. These planets are becoming brighter. Their magnetic field strength is getting higher. Their atmospheric qualities are changing. Uranus and Neptune appear to have had recent pole shifts. When the Voyager 2 space probe flew past Uranus and Neptune, the apparent north and south magnetic poles were sizably offset from where the rational pole was, or excuse me, rotational pole was. In one case, it was 50 degrees off, and in the other case, the difference was around 40 degrees, both which are pretty big changes. They're huge changes. Huge. I mean, just no way. As Dr. Alexander Dimitriev is the one I'm speaking of. I apologize. Uh, this here is on strange energy from Galactic Center bombarding Earth. I did not, could not get a date on this, but anyway. Uh, and by the way, this is all being taken from uh, Dr. Dimitrov's uh, papers that he wrote on this and all these websites that are publishing what he has written. It says, back in 1998, as astrophysicist Dr. Alex Alexei Dimitrov wrote a white paper outlining his discovery that strong evidence exists that these transformations are being caused by highly charged materials and energetic non-uniformities in uh, anastrophic interstellar space which have broken into the interplanetary area of our solar system. He described the arrival of an unknown force from the galactic void that's now surrounding much of the solar system. Dimitrov claimed that the entire solar system is entering an immense, potential, potentially deadly interstellar energy cloud of unknown origins. You see, friends, this is not being caused by global warming due to uh, greenhouse gases. But they don't have an answer, friends. Just like they can't figure out the Bible, they don't have an answer, all right? Now, we played this the other day, and I'm gonna play it for you again. Unfortunately, I don't think my mic can do it. I hope you can hear it okay. This is 
President Barack Obama and where he is speaking. This is after, by the way, we saw where Pope Francis talks about, uh, he does his uh, encyclical, and then he's speaking about uh, in another place there where um, in one of his famous quotes there that he hopes that the special interest groups, so to speak, don't get their way uh, that will deter the catastrophic climate change that we could have. Listen to, listen to uh, President Obama as he describes in this Dear interview. The Union, that no challenge poses a greater threat to future generations than climate change. Do you mean that it's a greater threat than terrorism? What I mean by that is that uh, we're going to get ISIL. They will be defeated. There will be ongoing efforts to uh, disrupt the world order from terrorists, from rogue states, from you know, cyber attacks. There's always some bad people out there trying to do bad things, and we have to be vigilant in going after them. Pay attention but close now. If you start seeing the oceans rise by five, six, seven feet, uh, if uh, you see major shifts in weather patterns so that what have been previously uh, bread baskets to the world suddenly can no longer grow food, then you're seeing the kind of crisis that we can't deal with through the deployment of the Marines. We can't deal with it through uh, throwing money at it. But what we know is that uh, as human beings are placed under strain, then bad things happen. I think that's suggestive what we wanted to see there. When he speaks about, President Obama is talking about when you see sea levels rise five, six, seven feet. When you see once was bread baskets of the world, such as the United States, they no longer are the bread baskets of the world. Then we do begin to think about the story of Joseph. We think about the famine, the great, you know, there were seven years of plenty and then seven years of famine. Now, my question is, is where are we at? You know, we haven't really hit the famine yet, it doesn't seem, or maybe we've already begun to creep into the famine already. All right, let's kind of move along here. Again, as I said, Planet X, this is the scenario that many of us think about. And of course, the scripture, Luke 21, 26, man's heart's failing them for fear and for looking after those things which are coming on the earth, for the powers of heaven shall be shaken. Now, Friends, we're moving into a very serious time frame. And I'm going to share with you what the Lord revealed to me today about the story of Joseph. I think it will bless you to say the very least. Genesis chapter 37, verses 26 to 28. Let's look at this verse. And Judah said unto his brethren, What profit it if we slay our brother and conceal his blood? Come and let us sell him to the Ishmaelites and let not our hand be upon him, for he is our brother and our flesh, and his brethren were, were content. Uh, then there passed by the Midianites merch, merchantmen, and they drew and lifted up Joseph out of the pit and sold Joseph to the Ishmaelites uh, for 20 pieces of silver. And they uh, brought Joseph into Egypt. All right? Now, so he changed his hands. Midianites, the Ishmaelites, to uh, Potiphar, uh, the chief captain of Joseph's guard. Now, this, we know also, is a type. Many biblical scholars already know this. It is a type that Joseph was sold out by his own people, just like Yeshua was sold out by the Jewish people, his own brethren of his day. He was born of them, a, 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 a son of Israel, and because he was spiritual, he was sold out by them. Now, I'll take it a step further, too. Let me just share with something. This is for my Jewish brethren that are listening. You know, because I, you already know that the Christian ideology is already there. You already know that. They always say that. You hear that all the time. But I will say something to you as well that you need to know. And that is that when Joseph was revealing himself back to his brethren, before he revealed his own identity, you begin to be blessed. Joseph's brothers were blessed. He blessed them. He put their corn back in their sack and he put their money back in. Why? Because you cannot buy eternal life. 
This is something that Joseph wanted to get across to his own brethren. The second thing that he did that I thought was very interesting was when they found their money the first time. If you notice, they were at the inn. They were at the little hotel there, the Babylon in Hebrews, Babylon hotel at the hotel when they're on their way back home with all this grain, then they go to feed their, 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 their uh, donkey at the hotel. They're going to feed him. And he opens up the corn sack to get a little bit of corn out to feed the animals. And then he finds their money in the sack. That was no coincidence, my Jewish brethren. You know why it was no coincidence? Because the very, fed, the very first place Yeshua was rejected was when he was in his own mother's womb and... Joseph trying to find a place for Yeshua to be born at in a hotel being the best, best place it could have been got for him. But unfortunately, the hotel guy had no room for him and sent him on down to a barn to get born in instead. So it was no coincidence that in the story of Joseph that Joseph's brothers find their money in the bag at the hotel. Because remember, Yeshua was sold out too for 30 pieces of silver. But he was rejected at the hotel. No different, no, no coincidence either that Benjamin, when he does come down, now remember Benjamin, Benjamin was not guilty. He was innocent. And when they dined with Joseph, what did Joseph do? He has his steward take and puts his cup in Benjamin's bag and sends him out and then overtakes him on the way and says, which one of you stole my cup? He put the cup in the innocent brother's bag. And that shows that even though 2,000 years ago, we say as Jews, well, we weren't there. That's right, we were not there. That is true. But still, the cup is in our bag today. What will we do with it? And Benjamin was innocent. He never had nothing to do with selling his own brother out. But nonetheless, Joseph puts that cup in his bag to show that even though he was innocent, he holds him responsible. And for my Christian brethren that think that all Jews go to hell just because they don't believe the way that you think they should believe, then you got a problem with the story because Joseph's brothers, every one, are redeemed. Remember, God requires repentance. Yeshua said repentance. John, the forerunner of Yeshua, said repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Yeshua HaMashiach. So the repentance is also not only in the Old Testament, it's in the New as well. And in fact, when it came to the, the time of Jonah, there was nowhere where Jonah ever said to the Ninevites, be sure to go up there to, the, uh, to Jerusalem and offer up some sacrifices also. No, he says, repent, or in 30 days the city will be destroyed. And they repented in sackcloth and ashes. Repentance, my brethren, is what God requires. Now, Looking at the story of Joseph, he sold out. We see this here, all right? Now, follow this closely. And the Mennonites sold him into Egypt unto Pontifer, an officer of Pharaoh and captain of the guard. Pharaoh is a type also of the, of the Catholic Church, or in this case here, like in the days of Constantine, he's a type of Constantine, and with Israel, with the Roman soldiers that were down in, down in Jerusalem. And it was one of the Roman soldiers that pierced Yeshua in his side. But what I do find interesting is Pontifer buys Joseph. And Pontifer is a true type of Constantine, in my opinion. He types Constantine to the T. And his wife, the prostitute that she was, was, trying to prostitute herself, trying to get Joseph to lay with her, is a type of the Catholic Church of today. You see, Yeshua already knows the Catholic Church married Constantine with his Mithras religion back at 325 Nicaea. So there's no way Yeshua is going to be with another man's wife. 
in the Vatican, the Catholic Church, the universal church as it's so-called is today, is married to Constantine, Pontifer's husband, or, uh, you know, in this case here, is Pontifer's wife is the Catholic Church in this case, as a type, as a type in there. Genesis chapter 39, verse 1, And Joseph was brought down to Egypt, Pontifer, and the officer of the Pharaoh, the captain of the guard. An Egyptian bought him out of the hands of the Ishmaelites, which had brought him down thither. By the way, some people think that it, they kind of get it mixed up. They think the Midianites, I'm sorry, never mind, my apology, skip that. Uh, let's move on. Uh, now, Genesis chapter 39, verse 7, this is where it gets interesting. Constantine marries the Catholic religion, which is what we were just talking about. And it came to pass after these things that his master's wife cast her eyes upon Joseph, and, he, and she said, lie with me. And this is exactly what happened when the Catholic Church first came into being. It was over a course of space of time there. And let me just kind of give you a little bit of a background on this. This is on Religion Today by Paul Flesher. Uh, just a little insight of what he says. How Constantine created the Christian Church, June 11, 2008. This is one of the things, just a little quick quote there. He says, but if the founding of the church is defined as the first body of the Christian leaders, who could determine accurate Christian belief and establish with sound authority their definition of Christianity across the Mediterranean world, then the single man most responsible for that achievement was Constantine I, the emperor of Rome, although the creation of the organization of the church was clearly a process that took place over several decades, the founding event was the Council of Nicaea at 325. And that's true. This is where it, it all started in. Now, the problem is, is Pontifer is a type of Constantine. And his wife is, is, is a perfect type of the Catholic Church. But what happens, they should have stayed with Christ. They claim to be married to Christ, but they're not. They went off and married Constantine, just like Pontifer's wife is already married to Potiphar. So there's no way Joseph's going to lay with a married woman. And it's the same thing with Yeshua. Yeshua will not be married to a prostitute. He will not be married to a whore. And that's exactly what the Catholic Church is according to Revelation, uh, I believe it's in chapter 18 as well. He won't have anything to do with it. She's already married and Joseph would not have nothing to do with Potiphar's wife. Now, Oh, this is what I already said here. Now, let me just share with you here as well. Um, by the way, Potiphar's wife was actually, her name was Zileka, and that's according to the book of Jasher. And for those of a little bit wish, not so sure about the book of Jasher, and there's two places in the Bible, the book of Samuel, but also in Joshua chapter 10, verse 13, it states, is not this written in the book of Jasher, not the part about Joseph, but it's just showing how that the book of Jasher was considered part of a biblical account uh, during the times of the book of Joshua uh, when it was written. So he says, uh, um, I wrote here on some of my own thoughts here, Yeshua would not mate with a prostitute, Potiphar's wife, Zilka. She was already another man's wife, and Constantine was already married to the Mithras religion of Satan. See, Yeshua would never allow his word to mix with demonic influence of the Roman Catholic Church. And not only the Roman Catholic Church, all the different denominations that have came out, that have spurned off from the Catholic Church, that have gone back to the Catholic Church. Do you really think that Yeshua is going to bring his word in with that? No, neither would Joseph, all right? Joseph would not do it either. Now, this is where it starts to get interesting. And this is what the Lord laid on my heart today. In Genesis chapter 40, verse 12 to 15, this is where Joseph interprets the butler's dream. And Joseph said unto him, this is the interpretation of it, three branches are three days. Yet within three days shall Pharaoh lift up thine head and restore thee unto thy place. That doesn't mean he's going to physically lift his head up. That's where they get that mixed up in, in the English translations a lot. It's his, 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 his position. In other words, he goes back to the source of where he was. Uh, and thou shalt deliver Pharaoh's cup into his hand after the former manner when thou was, was his butler. See, he's a cupbearer. But think on me when it shall be well with you, and show kindness, I pray thee, unto me, and make mention of me unto Pharaoh, and bring me out of this house. For indeed I was stolen away out of the land of the, of the Hebrews, and here also have I done nothing that they should put me in this dungeon." 
Now, the butler here is the wine bearer. And that's exactly what the Pope of Rome considers himself as well, the cupbearer of the Lord. In fact, the Catholic Church fully believes if you do not take communion with the Catholic Church, you're not saved. This is why the Pope recently ordered that, that Catholic churches around the world are to open up their churches to the uh, Gentiles or the, or the evangelicals or whatever you might have, any of the rest of the Christian world, and serve them communion because they believe unless you take up their cup, you're not saved. That's, that's Catholic doctrine, all right? Now notice, what does it say in verse 23 of Genesis chapter 40? Yet did not the chief butler remember Joseph, but forgot him. He forgot him and forgot him for two years. And it's no different than today. The Catholic Church, and believe me, Paul already speaking way back during the time right after Christ, he said then there were many grievous wolves already entered in, in among you. But from the time of Christ when he was crucified until the time we're living in now, over 2,000 years. The Catholic Church has totally forgotten Joseph. They left Yeshua in a dungeon somewhere, locked away. Even though he had the divine interpretation of the written word of God. See, those dreams represent, because see, the dream comes from God. The dreams are true. They represent the Word of God. And Yeshua had the true interpretation of God's Word, what it really says. But because, because, just like in the case, remember, it's, it's, a, it's a double, it's a twofold type here. All right? The cupbearer represents the church locking it away, but also the church represents Potiphar's wife, who's an adulteress, and Christ won't marry an adulteress. But in the case of Potiphar, he just, or in the case of the butler, he just forgets him. And that's what they did with Yeshua. They just forgot all about him and locked him away in a dungeon for the last 2,000 years. In his true word, his amazing ability the spiritual revelation and insight that Yeshua could give to reveal His Word has been locked away by creeds and dogmas. No wonder why they don't know what's going on with this Planet X. No wonder why they're not sure. No wonder why they got all different kind of ideas of how to be safe when the judgment of God comes in. When God says, those that hide themselves in the rocks of the earth, they'll cry out, for the rocks and them that fall on them. The Pope is no different. They dug themselves some big caves in the earth as well. But see, he forgot about the fact that Joseph could interpret his dreams. There is a coming famine, fam, friends. In the book of Jasher, by the way, it records the details of all the wise men and the sorcerers and magicians trying to interpret Pharaoh's dreams, but no one knew the right answers. If you read the book of Jasher, that's the one thing that's kind of interesting about the story of Joseph. Everything is the same, just like what we see in Genesis, but in this case here, Genesis gives us the account, none of them could answer his dreams. In the book of Jasher, still, the truth is there, none of them could answer it, but they all tried to answer it, and, and, and it goes into all the uh, the the, the storyline of how this happened and how Pharaoh was upset because none of them had the ability to understand. And it said that even Pharaoh had the wisdom to know that they didn't know the true interpretation of his dreams. And the Pope today has all his magicians, all his false prophets, all his priests, all of his evangelists, you know, everything you can think of. Even messianics, he's got them as well. I'm not saying that all messianics are, are nothing like I don't say that. And just same thing with evangel evangelicals. Not all evangelicals are caught up in nonsense. But my point is, is he's got all these different groups here trying to work on the answers for him. And none of them can get it right. They just hit and miss at it. Okay? So remember, Joseph said the dreams of Pharaoh were from God. All right? Now, but they have kept 
They have kept it locked up for the last 2,000 years. Yeshua's word, imprisoned by the Catholic Church. You see, friends, this is what God has called me to do. Is expose what the Vatican is doing, what the Pope of Rome is doing. There's, there is a famine coming, friends. And whether they want to say it's by greenhouse gases, or, or whether it's Planet X or whatever it's going to be, there is coming a major famine on this earth that's going to send people mad. And the problem is, is you're not going to get any true answers from the Catholic Church or any of their little cohorts out there trying to tell you what's the truth. And in fact, in most cases, they're going to hide it. But Yeshua still knows the truth. He knows what Pharaoh's dreams really mean. If he is released and not imprisoned as the Vatican has done with their creeds and dogmas, then we will know what the wisdom is to prepare for the coming judgment. You know, I want to thank Brother Chris Ray, his channel, Bible Code Theory Research. He did a video recently, a code that he did on the book I wrote, Yom Suf. And the title of the video is called Stephen Benoon, Yom Suf in the Bible Codes. On his channel, Bible Code Theory Research. I want to share with you just, it's just a little clip at the very end that he says in here. And what Brother Chris did here, he mentioned to me once in an email that he was doing this, but I, I just saw it just yesterday for the first time. It helped remind me of what God called me to do. And I know tonight is just kind of a rough little way of putting something together here. But someone's got to tell my people the truth. Because they are going to try to make the Pope of Rome look like a Messiah or some man that they will dictate, whatever the case may be. The Pope of Rome my Jewish brother, is not the salvation of Israel. He's not the Mashiach, never will be. And right now they're gathering, they're, they're, they're using the government people in Israel to justify to put a NATO force in our country. God's setting up the stage. He will send his two witnesses and they're going to reveal what the Vatican has hid all these years. Let me share with you, I've said enough tonight. I want to share with you guys real quick a little excerpt that Brother Chris did here. Uh, I trust it's a blessing for you. Let me see Let me see real quick if I can get my microphone here to be able to pick up the audio of this a little better here for you. You can watch it yourself. Go to Brother Chris's channel, check it out. I'll put a link to the video in the description of this video here. Let's catch this here. That is a representation of Christ, and his light is his glory, the light that comes off. And I believe this is talking about lighting the light in the Jewish people, the light of Yeshua, the true light of Yeshua through his ministry, through uh, Stephen Ben Nun, through his ministry in these last days. I believe he was commissioned to do this. Why? Maybe because this guy is going to present himself as Messiah to the nation of Israel, to the Jew. And maybe that's not exactly what Brother Stephen Bendenin wants for his own people to be deceived like this. Maybe Brother Stephen Bendenin wants his own people to know who the real Messiah is. Amen. So watch Brother Stephen Bendenin, watch his video, get his book, look out for the devil. I'll talk to you later. Blessings to you all, and until we meet again. Brother Chris, he's a precious brother. We've known each other for many, many years. In fact, from the very start of my ministry, uh, Brother Chris and I, we've known one another. And he's always been a, a, a real blessing uh, to me as well. And I thank him very much. Uh, it, it, for me, it was an inspiration, very much inspiration. Uh, the whole video is very interesting. You really have to watch the whole video to understand where he's coming from. So anyway, God bless you, and thank you for watching. 
I'm Stephen Badoon with Israel News Live. Show.